So today's session is, um, it's really more about an interior finishes workflow. How many of you guys work with interior finishes? Okay. So um, I'm a recovering architect. I worked as a pseudo interior designer when they let me. Uh, so my perspective related to some of these workflows is based on my 20 years of experience in the industry. Um, as a Dorofus user, uh, I've not been using Dorofus nearly as long as Rolf has. Uh, I think Rolf has close to 10 million logins on our server uh, before we even had a server. We weren't, we weren't tracking him. So um, one of the things that uh, I'm, I'm planning on kind of sharing is some specific workflows related to interior finishes. Um, I say that because Dorofus is not just an interior finish tool. I made the mistake when I gave a presentation showing our Revit plugin. People left thinking that we were just a Revit plugin tool. So I, I'm using the caveat that there's actually a lot of things that Dorofus can do. So over the next nine hours, I'm going to go over all of those details in depth. And uh, joking aside, it will really just be a short presentation related to interior finishes. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of demo through video. Uh, I'm doing that so that if you want to go back later and just watch the video clips of the portions, you'll actually have access and you can see those clips individually and you don't have to watch the whole presentation if you just want to go back to something specifically. Um, this is the San Francisco Dorofus user group. There are several Dorofus user groups around the world. Uh, this one is one of the oldest. Um, we had our, our first meeting a few years ago at, at the WeWork place uh, that I was working at. and. I think what we've seen is that this user group has grown a lot over time. There's peaks of interest. It tends to fluctuate when the economy is fluctuating. So everyone is really busy right now. So we're actually finding that there's less participation in the user groups. Whereas when it's a little slower, people tend to have a little bit more flexibility and needing to fill in their evenings with some non-work activities. So I was anticipating that tonight was going to be a little bit thin compared to what we've had in the past. Uh, but it is important to know that our user groups are around the world. So if you are traveling and you have to be in, in one of the cities that does have a user group, you can look them up on Meetup. It sounds like a few of you guys did find us through Meetup. Um, the other aspect related to this is that we tend to broadcast these. So uh, if you are working remote or um, you're not able to attend, but you're one to still participate, uh, you can always join us uh, via online. Uh, the one link that I'm going to share with you uh, to point to is just meetup.com slash pro slash Dorofus, that will actually show you all of the user groups. So if you have friends in Dallas or Atlanta or other cities and you want to point them to those other user groups, um, you can kind of go from there to, to actually see that information. Uh, Rolf Jerving, he's our CEO of Dorofus. He's our guest speaker tonight. Uh, I'm going to be doing a short demo presentation and he's going to talk a little bit about how Dorofus is being used uh, around the globe. My name is Brock Howard. I'm the technical account manager. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that I help people actually implement Dorofus. So uh, chances are that if you're learning Dorofus, I joke at, when, I, when I see people from HOK, I always joke that people tell me that they know me because they listen to a 100 hours of Dorofus training videos when I used to work at HOK. Uh, if, if you find that you want to learn Dorofus, uh, chances are I'll be the one eventually helping you with implementation or training. So. Uh, feel free to ask me specifically if you want to learn more how that happens. Uh, the two things that I'm going to be touching on today that relate to the way that you can use Dorofus for finishes is in two different approaches. One of these approaches we refer to as room data. Another way is using items. The basic premise difference between items and room data is you can think of room data as just information. So like if we were to describe this room, we would have a temperature we would have some sort of uh, needs to require the acoustics of this space and other aspects. I'm thinking of it as finishes. So you could specify a room using text or data. The other way is using items. And the way that we think of items are things that you might want to quantify. So a table or a chair or a light fixture, those things might need an actual quantity. You might need to actually procure them. So thinking of them as actual items, sometimes goes beyond just room text information, actually has more information. And what I'm going to be talking about is the difference between room data being very simple, text-based kind of information versus an item approach gives you a lot more capability. So it lets you go beyond just a room requirement, but actually maybe doing it as sequential. Think of that as a schematic design versus design development versus a CD, the way that you tend to think about the evolution of interior finishes. It's also parallel. 
So you might be designing 20 rooms on the first floor and someone else is designing 20 rooms on the second floor. Those things can happen simultaneously because you, they actually might be designed and delivered at different phases. You've worked on projects that have different phases and different sizes. Sometimes the fifth floor is still being programmed when the first floor is under construction. There might be different evolutions of that progression. So when we're thinking about room data, specifically with Doropus, I, I think of this in three different buckets. If I'm an owner, let's say that I'm Kaiser Permanente or I, I'm some large owner like Avanor is the largest user of Doropus at the airports in Norway. So I'm an owner of requirements. I think of room data when it comes to standards and I think of it as this is what I would want as an owner as my standard of requirements for finishes. So I might use room data to say all my offices should have carpet and should be painted. That might be enough to inform someone who's going to use my standard to go beyond and actually start thinking about those as finished requirements. If I'm a planner, meaning I'm a space planner or interior designer thinking about the planning, I might look at my program, my space program, and say, I've got 25 offices. I need to design all of those to have the similar requirements. So as a planner, I might use Dorofis with room data to say all my offices need to have carpet and paint. So from that standpoint, I don't have a standard that's coming from the owner. I might be developing a standard to make some efficiencies related to how I might be working. And then as a designer, I need to then start thinking about, well, what are the requirements so I know what to now research? You've been in the bucket before where you know that the floors are going to be carpeted, but there's a million decisions that you now need to make about based on that carpet. Is it broad gloom? Is it, is it going to be tiled? And if it's tiled, what's going to be the tile style that I'm going to do for that carpet? Am I going to have accents? And instantly, as a designer, you start going beyond that. But all you need to know is the room data is informing you that I don't need to be thinking about my terrazzo finish for this particular room type. So the room data can be driving the decisions that you make later as a designer. So if we flip over to the video here, this is just an example. I'm going to turn the volume down so I don't hear myself double here. Um, th <clears throat> this is an example that if I'm a designer, if I'm an owner, or if I'm a planner, I would use a room template to then define these standards. So it's very easy. I simply go into a room template. In this case, we're looking at an office. I'm specifying that there is going to be a floor finish. And for that floor finish, it needs to be carpeted. So in a matter of a couple seconds, I've clicked a couple of buttons and I've essentially used a form to define the specific requirements for this office. Now this office standard is being applied to 11 rooms and it's happening all at once. So in a matter of about 30 seconds, I've defined the finished requirements at a schematic design level. All that information is applied to the rooms and if later the decision is all my offices now want to be different, I can modify the room template and now that's already updated all those rooms. You maybe want to add that the alternatives that is showed obviously is customizable, meaning that it's not like a fixed uh, setup of, uh, uh, of alternatives for the finishes. That's a very good point. I have yet to see to see one Doropus database that are using room data the same way. And anytime you give an architect or an owner the opportunity to customize the tool, they're going to customize it to that nth degree. So the examples you're seeing here is very simple uh, finish requirements. I had a call today where there's actually close to 70 different requirements that they've set for room finishes. So depending on the complexity of the client or the project, you might see variations. Uh, this is where I'm going to show a little tip. If you see the, the line across the screen, this is kind of my saying, if you're a Dorofus user, pay attention. Um, one of the tips that I wanted to share here is if you do use a checkbox in your room data requirements, there are opportunities of checking against your item requirements later against these. We call that the room data to items check. So if a room needs to have floor finishes, does it have a floor finish as an item later? We can check against that and confirm that the design has actually met those, excuse me, those requirements. Another way of working would be working with items. So we've talked about room data where that might be quality text driven, check boxes, drop down menus, the menu kind of aspect of room data. The other aspect is using items. And the way that we think of items is even though we're talking about paint on the wall or carpet on the floor, someone has to physically make that decision and make a product purchase, right? They have to buy either a gallon of paint or 100 gallons of paint or they need to buy a certain uh, ream of, of carpet or a certain number of squares of carpet. 
So when you think of that as someone needs to actually procure these things, it's good to shift the thinking and actually think of this as items. So if I'm an owner, same thing, I'm setting a standard. If I'm a planner, I'm thinking about what are the requirements. So this is similar to using room data because I'm thinking of this generically. So then this example, I've got carpet and I've got paint, but I don't know what color carpet and I don't know what color paint. I'm using this as like a generic placeholder. It helps me get to a schematic design level so I at least know the number of rooms that have carpet and the number of rooms that have paint. So this video is a little similar to what I was sharing with room data, but in this context, you can kind of see the workflow is still very similar. I would still go into a room template. I would still click on, instead of room data, I would click on my finishes list. And in this finishes list, I can then specify all of the finishes based on location. We can be a little bit better about the finish requirements because now I can say, I know I want carpet on the floor. So I can actually use an item category list to specify that carpet's on the floor. And you'll notice that when I'm selecting these different categories, it's filtering to the items that make sense in that location. I'm not, look, I'm not finding that paint is showing up on the floor and I'm not seeing carpet show up the walls. Even though we know plenty of designers that want to put carpet on the walls and paint on the floor, those things are still a way of filtering the data that we're actually trying to specify. So again, it's still very simple from a workflow standpoint of how we might be working, just specifying it with an item. So if we think about this as a process, that means that as a designer, I might decide I just need room data right now. The only thing that I need to specify on the project is that I have carpet and paint. That might be enough for a developer to then go to a contractor and say, all I need you to know is that all my offices are going to be 15 bucks a square foot for carpet. That helps them then estimate the overall project. They don't need floor plans. Ironically, uh, many times they can do estimates just with that level of information. So if you went through and specified all of the finishes at a conceptual level, that might be enough for that phase. As you get into the beyond conceptual and you get into the schematic design phase, it might be important to know that now we're dealing with specific items. So in this case, we're saying paint and we're saying carpet. The tip that I wanna show here is that we can think about a workflow of using a parent-child relationship. And parent-child is a database term that relates to inheriting specific specifications from one to the other. And you can think of it as your own parents. I inherited my receding hairline from my mom and I related my humor from my dad those are attributes that I have inherited from my parents. So that parent-child relationship works the same way with databases. I can have a parent paint item in this case that says, I don't want to make sure that this paint is the standard. The paint's going to go on the walls. I can then create a series of child items that are based on that paint. That is now a blue paint and a purple paint and a green paint. So it goes to the next level of specification, inheriting the qualities from the parent. So if we go back to the parent and we say that the parent needs to be glossy, all of the paints below that would also be glossy. The colors would be the same, but now their finish is actually different. So from a workflow standpoint, we can take this to that next level using items. So here we can think about this generic aspect. We've gone from the uh, conceptual design to the schematic design. I've got a template that has defined my offices. And now I want to go and do research related to the different paints that I might have on a project. This is the items module. So from here, I would start with my parent and I can build these child items. My P1, my P2, my P23, all of those different paints are then being specified to the next evolution of the color. So now you can see at the very bottom, room data starts to specify the specifics of those different children. So in this case, you'll see I have a drop down menu that I can pick from. And that list of colors is actually the colors that's on Sherwin-Williams website that they have as a search mechanism. And if you've ever picked out paint before, there's no such thing as blue paint. Because if you go to Sherwin-Williams website and you look up blue, there's now 90 more decisions you need to make. What shade of blue are you now looking for? And when we think of shades of blue, we, we think of those as actual products. So the evolution here is I've started generically that there is a paint requirement. I then can derive those rooms from the templates that they started from to then go to the specific. So I'm deriving those templates from, I just know it's an office with paint, to now I want to start specifying the type of paint that has been applied. All I have to do now is select the occurrences that were PT with the holder to actually define it as PT2. So I've elevated those occurrences. 
I can now apply a product to all those occurrences. So now the paint chip of SW9040 on Sherman Williams' website has now been applied to all my offices. So very quickly, I can go from the conceptual design of these rooms need to have paint to I know we're going to use PT2, which is green, to its paint chip SW9362 on the Sherman Williams products page. So that evolution is all using the same information and it's enhancing it as you go through the schematic design, design develop CD kind of phase. Does that make sense from a workflow standpoint? I think I know that typically when I worked on this before, I would be thinking of my paints with like uh, an Excel spreadsheet. I might be using a room tag to define that it's gonna be actually carpet. And then I would have to figure out, well, how many PT codes do I have? Have I already used PT9 or can I reuse PT7? And it starts to get really muddy really quickly. And then there's also the aspect of <coughs> using Sherwin-Williams as my basis of design doesn't mean that the contractor is gonna specify Sherwin-Williams, but it might be enough to then communicate that this is the quality of paint that I'm looking for. This is my basis of design. Does all that make sense to you guys? So from an aspect of going into the notion of products, you don't have to go to products, right? You could have stopped saying that PT2 was good enough and that green paint was sufficient. The timing of this varies across projects, right? In some cases, you might only be at a phase that paint is the, the decision. So you have your offices that already know that it's green paint and you know the Sherman Williams paint chip numbers, but your conference room, you just know that there's gonna be three different types of paint. You just know there's gonna be an accent wall. So the variations of parallel efforts means that you're not making a decision like we historically do. I'm at this design phase, therefore I have to stop. You can start moving forward on parts that you do have the decisions on. So if you know that you're gonna be using the offices consistently, you can sign that off. You can kind of consider that part done and then focus on the lobby, focus on the things that might be more fun to design with, the ones that might have more decisions to be made. So the evolution of this is all being tracked with the different phases. So when you do see a room that has a product identified and you're not the designer, maybe you're the project manager, well, now you can look at the room and you can understand, wow, this room is further along. This room has gotten approval. We've already made the decision. We know that it's not just green. We know that it's specifically the Sherwin-Williams paint. So I can probably start getting those things estimated within my budget at a higher level of quality. The transparency of that data information is really important. The thing I want to highlight here is we have this feature in Dorf is called composite text. And the idea behind this is that we are not the only database in the planet. Sherwin-Williams has their own <clears throat> database. So if I were to go to Sherwin-Williams website and I were to type in green, it actually uses a database to search through their entire data set. So we can use the same URL strings and tie those in as a composite text and actually use the rules that are on Sherwin-Williams website. So in this case, when I put in the, the number of SW9075, because I learned that in my research phase, now I can go back later and click on that link and get the rest of the product information. Or I can actually share that link with my product specification team and they can then find out what's the uh, VOC related to that. You know, what's the actual credits that I'm gonna get related to the, uh, the, the content? <coughs> Is it recyclable paint? You know, it, they might find other things related to that paint that are more relevant. I don't want to put an entire three-part specification into Dorofus if I can point them to the pieces that are freely available from the research that I might have done. And that's the idea behind the hyperlinks. The other thing to think about is the difference between items and products. Items are generic, products are specific. So when we think of the evolution of, I knew that it was a PT-02 and it's green, that's a generic paint. The moment I applied a product to it, it's now product specific. I've, I've evolved it from being generic to being product specific. The main difference behind products and items is items have a budget price. I think it's gonna be 50 bucks a, a bucket for this paint. That's what I'm budgeting. That's what I've been told I'm looking for. At a product level, I might actually get a specific unit price from my personal builder who's gonna be estimating the project. He might tell me, uh, 50 bucks a gallon is actually uh, the wrong number. This is the real unit price for that Sherwin-Williams SW9632 paint that you picked because that shade of blue has only been used on six projects. So it's really hard to get. 
So instantly I can compare my budget specific information to my unit prices and I can be tracking where I'm at within the project knowing that I can compare those two unit and budget prices together. I'm not doing Derofas to estimate the amount of paint I'm purchasing. We can go there. I'm not going to go there on right now, but I might just need to know is 50 bucks a gallon compared to 60 bucks a gallon. Am I good with that 10% $10 difference? That's the real value to share here. So the room data approach allows us to kind of evolve the way that this is working, but how does this work with Revit? How does this work from a design standpoint? When we think about being a Revit user, I tend to have to put some walls in, I have to put some doors in before someone believes that I have a floor plan. So there's that kind of evolution of visual representation to say I'm actually further along. When I put a room in that model, I then have to fill out, I call it the Revit form. I put in a room and then I say what the name of the room is, what's the uh, room number for that room, and now I have to start putting in more data inside that little text box that's inside of my Revit experience. So that Revit properties dialog box tends to be where people do data entry. Are most of you guys kind of with me related to that effort? The idea behind this is that if you're using Dorofus, as you place a room in your model, all of the data that's in Dorofus could populate in your model during that time. So if I'm in a conceptual design phase and I'm placing rooms, I don't know what the Sherman Williams paint chip number is that is going to be on the north wall of that office. I have no idea at that design phase. But I do know that if I place that office, I want to know if it's going to be carpeted because that's going to help me inform the designer to then think about the carpet that might be involved. So I might be an architect, I might be the interior designer, but I don't actually know more than what I have at a schematic design level. So when we think about this from a Revit standpoint, if we're just thinking about this with room data, all I need to know is what is the room and where is it located because that's my Revit responsibility at this point. I'm now making a design decision. So in this case, when my room in Revit is linked to my room in Dorofus, which I won't show in detail here, but basically all I have to do is place the room in Revit, and it will actually give me a list of rooms that are inside of Dorofus. So this particular room that I'm linking to, this office that's kind of an office floor plan, I, I can't make the decision based on the north wall and south wall. I just need to know what the finishes are. So this room was placed using the tool and we can see all the information that's in Dorofus, the name of the room, the size of the room, and I can also see that it's carpeted and painted. So I didn't have to do anything more in Revit for that information to actually get communicated to the actual uh, database. We're using an attribute configuration, which is basically the handshake between Dorofus and Revit. What's the agreed upon communication that's happening here? This information that's in Dorofus is gonna go into Revit. So we're making a decision, an agreement, that the data in Dorofus is going to populate the Revit model. I don't want to now use Revit to do data entry because I've already got a database that's populating the information. So the Revit room, which defaultly comes with base and wall and floor and finish kind of parameters, I want to use that in my Revit schedule. So all I need to do in this case is synchronize my Dorofus room that has the room data requirements with the Revit room that was blank. So I just synchronized and all of that information has been populated in the room. So at a schematic design level, painted and carpeted is perfectly fine. And if I looked at the finished schedule and I saw painted and carpeted, I know that they haven't picked a paint chip color yet, right? They just know it at a, a conceptual <coughs> design level. So if we think about this kind of evolving from the standpoint of using room data and now going into items, again, an evolution of thinking, all I have to do is start populating my items in my rooms. So while one person is working in Revit, actually laying out the walls and trying to decide how big the rooms are, in parallel, I could have an interior designer building that list of finishes, doing the research, doing the color analysis, deciding if it's going to be seven shades of blue or if it's going to be two shades of green. That decision is not happening in Revit, but Revit can then be informed by those decisions. All I have to do inside of Revit is change the handshake, change the agreement between the information that's in Dorofus and the information that's inside of Revit. So from this standpoint, the workflow is really simple. We've evolved to the design development phase. So all I need to do is inform my team we're moving from schematic design to DD. Hopefully that would happen communicating anyways, right? So as a designer, I just need to change the configuration that I'm using. I picked the drop-down menu. It was schematic design. Now it's design development. 
the handshake, the rules have changed. Now the items that are inside the room are now going to drive the same parameters inside of Revit. Those same default parameters of floor, base, wall, and fi finish the ceiling information, that's now going to get populated based on the item information. The fact that I'm using PT-1 and PT-2 for those paints. So in this case, I want to update all of my rooms, not just that one room. So here I can synchronize all 21 rooms on that floor and now they all have that finished information. So instantly my, my schedule has been populated and all of those codes have now gone from painted and carpeted to now showing PT1 and the ceiling or the carpet actually says CPT with two money signs as placeholders. So this also informs my design team that we've made the decision on the walls, we haven't made the decision on the carpet yet. So it's that in-between design development. It's like, I never really knew what 55% design development meant, but that's probably what that means. We know the paint, but we don't know the carpet yet, but it's enough for us to move forward on. The other aspect behind this is because we're driving the data from a database into a visual tool inside of Revit, when we make decisions like generic carpet to carpet specific, we can simply set up a color schedule inside of Revit, a color scheme that then drives the color representation. So if I have a view inside of Revit that's called finishes, and I can see that one office is purple and one office is green or blue, what does that tell me? It tells me that one of the rooms, the carpet has been decided on, and one of the rooms is still using a placeholder. So I can have this evolution being visually represented. If it had a different color, it might actually tell me that it's just carpeted. And I can use a simple Revit workflow to illustrate those decisions. Revit does a really good job of graphically representing information, but that information being managed is a nightmare in Revit. So here we're managing the information, the data outside, and we're informing the model and letting the model do what it's supposed to do by updating it from a color reference or graphics representation. We also have a feature that came out, and if you guys haven't seen this new feature with 2.0, we basically have the ability to auto sync the information we're working from. So you'll notice that there were two instances where I had to select a room and hit synchronize, or I had to pick a bunch of rooms and hit synchronize. Well, that synchronizing effort has now been upgraded to now be auto syncing. So now as a designer, I can just keep working. I can move the walls around, I can continue to make changes, and the finished information is constantly being updated within the model. In fact, anything that I want to be updating from Dorofus can be auto-synchronizing as well. So now the designer can just focus on actually using Revit to lay out their spaces. Someone else in the database can be making the data decisions, like what's the finishes and what requirements are they? And that populated model is constantly just getting this stream of information, this updated information, and letting the designer just work. All that syncing is automatically happening. It is bi-directional because we're pushing some data from Revit, so the handshake, the agreement, is Revit wants to tell me how big the room is. But I want to tell Revit what the name of the room is. So that decision of Revit controlling one thing and Dorofus controlling the other is that agreement that's part of that attribute configuration. So in this case, what ends up happening is the Revit user places rooms in Revit, and that's it. Because guess what Revit does really, really well? It tells you the design area. Does anyone ever sit there and calculate how big the rooms are in Revit? No, the walls automatically do that. So now the designer, the room name automatically comes from Dorofus. <laughs> all the finishes come from Dorofus. All the other requirements related to the acoustical needs or, or the temperature of the room, all of that's coming from Dorofus. And the designer can focus on moving the walls and placing the rooms in the model, which is really what they should be focusing on if they're designing inside of Revit. They should be focusing on the space. And that's the real beauty behind the auto tracking feature. Chrissy, yeah. Does Dorofus have any ability to change a wall finish on a red wall, like uh, to go to actually change that wall type of tile, exterior finish? It depends on how it's built in Revit, because there's a tricky thing in Revit where if we were designing a wall and we've got 20 offices, do you design that wall with one wall? that represents the 20 offices? Or do you build 20 walls that are 10 feet wide in between each wall? Because if each of those walls have a different finish, it has to be a different wall. 
if I'm trying to put uh, stone on one side and brick on the other, I've got to build that wall with the right orientation. We can connect to all of that information and we can populate it with data. But if you've decided that your representation of stone is a grid pattern, and Cesar's representation of stone is actually the actual pattern of the stone, we can't change those patterns because that's not data driven, that's graphically represented. The fact that it's thicker and it might be two inches, it again depends on how it's modeled. If you talk to the, the guys in um, Denmark who are actually using Dorovis, they might actually just want the wall to be six inches wide, but you might actually design it to be two layers of jip on this side and one layer of jip on that side, it, that's a modeling decision that happens inside of Revit. So what we tend to do really well is driving the data. So we can push into Revit the wall types that you need. We can push into Revit the fact that they actually are being tagged as certain wall types. We can also push in some of the parameters related to that wall, as long as we can connect to the actual parameters to those family content pieces. But where I've seen real value behind when it comes to finishes is materials inside of Revit. So when we decide to push in purple and green and blue paint, we can tie to the Revit materials that actually represent the colors. So we've seen designers use the paint bucket tool in actual you know, workflows of actually painting the walls with a paint color. And then when the paint chip changed from PT1 to PT2, the tags update. So using actual material tags enhances your workflow. But you talk to 100 BIM managers, half of them will tell you to never use that workflow, and half of them will tell you that's what I've been doing for years. So from a workflow standpoint, we can definitely drive the data. It kind of depends on the modeling strategy on how to impact that. Does that answer your question? The last thing I wanted to show, and then I want to give the ball to uh, to Rolf to share a little bit, of, is this Dorofus Web. How many have you heard about Dorofus Web? A couple people. I know Beatrix has. <laughs> So Dorofus Web is a lot of the information that I was showing in the client, but in a view that's in a browser. So rather than installing the software and having to actually uh, have a PC where you log in, Dorofus Web is all the information that's in Dorofus, but accessible in a browser. So in the browser, I can see all the live information that was in Dorofus, the room names, the finish requirements, the products, images, documents, all the things that are stored in Dorofus, but in a web-based environment. We did that because if you build an app on a phone, you have to figure out which phone to build it on. Is it an Android phone? Is it an iOS phone? Some people still have Blackberries. Using a browser means that it can go anywhere and be accessible anywhere. So in this case, I actually have Dorofus Web on my iPad. So when I'm, I'm showing this here, you're more than welcome to kind of click around and kind of experience that in an iPad. But we've designed Dorofus Web as a way of thinking about the use of this technology as a touchscreen environment. So the industry has really moved forward where web design, I call it fat finger design. It's really intended to be something that you would use with your hands. And I actually have a touch screen here. So for those of you guys that are watching, I can actually click on my screen and click on the things that I'm working from. It's a very different workflow than the way that you would work within a uh, client or within a software environment where a mouse is usually how you're driving the information. So in the aspect of I'm trying to find information related to these different rooms, I simply select the room and I can get the information about that room. This could be the room data that we were talking about before. So if I, I wanted to see this room information, I could see that the fact that there are finishes. One of the things that I was looking for before was uh, the offices, right? So I could come in here and I'm gonna use my keyboard just to type in office. And I can search across the entire database to see all the offices throughout the project. Now before we were talking about using a template to drive this. So now I can simply go into the database, look at one of these offices and find out, well, what's the room data requirements? Carpeted and painted. So with a couple of clicks, I can go into the exact same database and see that information. I knew this project moved beyond and now it's actually in design development so now I can go in and find out a little bit more about the carpet that's been specified. So now I'm drilling into the data. I'm looking at this specific carpet. I wanna understand something more about this carpet. So I can go directly to the CP1 carpet and actually find out specific information regarding that carpet. So all this is available. So if we think about transparency of the information, I might actually invite people to access information. I don't want them editing it 
So the great thing about the web is that I can now be transparent. Rather than sending someone an Excel spreadsheet or a PDF, I can send them a link and they can see this information via that sharing aspect. So let's go back to some of those items that we were talking about before, like the, um, the paint. I can see all of the finished information that might be accessible in the project. So when I'm talking about the paint, maybe I'm looking for this specific paint. What information can I see about that paint? I can see where that paint has been applied, the rooms that it relates to. I can see if there's any templates that are being driven based on that paint. I might also want to see information related to the images or documents and other things about it. I can access all that information from this list. And one of the things that you'll notice is that I also have a product defined for this particular paint. So from here, I can go directly to the product, and now I can understand a little bit more about the product information, like what the paint chip color is. I have all this accessible and available to me because it's available in the web. So I like to think of the web as either the way that I might want to share the information with my contractor, or the information I want to share back to the owner, or in some cases, a project manager who's actually on the same team as me, but I don't want them actually editing my Revit file just to know what paint finishes I'm actually working on. It's a great communication tool of sharing that information. That's the name of the project that I actually made. Oh. So that's actually the name of the actual project that I created so that it was easier to kind of communicate this. And the viewer is a, like a thin viewer? It is. It, it's basically, it, it's a, it's a technology for us to be able to show more than just the data, but actually showing it with a model environment. Um, the, the transition that I was going to show here goes beyond the web and it relates to IFC. How many of you are familiar with IFC? So IFC, I have falsely for years been calling it Industry Foundation Classifications. I was recently corrected by an Australian. It's Industry Foundation Classes. So I want to make sure I'm on the record for those guys that I have been corrected there. An IFC is a format that is agnostic to the design tool it came from. So if I sent you a Revit file that I built 10 years ago, would you appreciate that? Probably not, because you probably aren't running a version of Revit from 10 years ago. So now you're waiting for it to upgrade to several versions of a compatible version you can work with. The idea behind IFC is that I can now put a version of that model to share it with other people. And that's the demonstration I'm talking about today. There's one checkbox that I want to point out that's going to be important. There's a little checkbox inside of Revit when you're exporting to IFC, and it's called Export Revit Property Sets. I've actually talked to the Autodesk guys to suggest that that's a default checkbox, because if I'm in Revit, why would I not want Revit properties? But with that said, you need the Revit properties if you want to get the Revit built-in parameters. So those parameters like floor, wall, ceiling finish, those are Revit specific properties that aren't necessarily default IFC properties. So if I wanna include that information in my IFC, I have to have that box checked. Once I have an IFC that comes out of Revit, I can upload it to Dorofus Web, and this is where that model viewer comes into play. So this could be a version of my design, it could be the schematic design IFC, it could be my Friday upload IFC, it's the version of the design at that time. So it's good to have a version that I can then share with others because if they're working in my live model environment, how many times do you work with an architect and they've moved something and they weren't ready to share with you? So there's an aspect of, well, wait until Friday, I'll give you a version I'm willing to share with. That's the idea behind this IFC. So if I do have an IFC that I've shared, that means that I can go into Dorofus Web and turn on the viewer. So when I turn on the viewer, I'm essentially viewing the version of the model that was uploaded. So in this case, when I'm looking inside of my functions, maybe I'm looking in a specific department, it's gonna find all the rooms that are in that department, and I'm able to isolate and navigate to the specific rooms that are in that project. So in this case, this is a 2D graphical representation that came from Revit. That might be helpful. But what I can also do is I can have a three-dimensional representation that can also be even more helpful that's the version of the IFC. What's great about this too is those items that I have planned against. So my resolution's a little tight because of the screen here, but you can imagine if I'm working with all of the requirements, I might think of these as items. So the items in this case, I have tables, I have chairs, furniture requirements. These are the items. What's down here? The finish requirements. Now we don't expect the modeler 
to actually model the paint inside the IFC. But at least I can see that paint was a requirement in this actual room. When I load the IFC, now I can see those specific requirements, and now I can see that uh, mirror that was on the wall. I didn't see the mirror in the floor plan because it was on the wall. But this can be really helpful to confirm that the mirror was actually modeled in the modeling environment. I can also see some information related to the tables and chairs. So if I select one of those chairs, it's gonna highlight the specific chair that's been planned in the model. So this helps me validate from an IFC standpoint the versions of these files. I can then inform the architect, I can send them this hyperlink and I can say that specific chair that you've modeled is the wrong chair. It's not meeting our standards. That goes back to the workflow of they got two chairs, they feel like they're done, but it's the wrong chairs. Or I can specify the product that they should be using for that chair. They don't need to model the Herman Miller specific modeled chair for this to work. They can model it to an LOD that makes sense for what they're doing because it's IFC compliant. I can then tell them that it's the Herman Miller make and model of that requirement. So now the model can be super lightweight. It can be very transparent. It can be simple to what's necessary to deliver their drawings. And Deropis can hold all that other information that relates to that specific uh, equipment or furniture. The Revit user needs to tag the room so that it's CPT. Right, that's all they have to do. Well, we can help them because we can automate tagging it. Then inside of Duropis, we can enhance it with product information. We can add the Sherman Williams paint chip numbers and those kind of things to it. So the models become smaller, they become deliverable, they become tools of actually communicating the design. So we see IFC as a way for an architect to say to an owner, here's my design deliverable based on your requirements. And then as an owner, I could come in and say, okay, let me check your model against what was designed. If I'm looking at the property information for these rooms, I can then check against what was the actual planned area versus the design area. This gives me that direct information that I can tie back to that IFC. So you don't want your owner in your Revit file, and if your owner is providing you the design requirements, now all of a sudden you can focus on design, which is I think where most people actually wanna spend their time as architects or designers. I'm gonna transition now, maybe take a break, maybe to get a glass of wine at this point. I feel like I deserve maybe a, a glass of wine. And I'm gonna give the ball to Rolf to share a little bit about how Dorofus is being used around the globe. Uh, I mentioned earlier that Rolf is the CEO at Dorofus. He's also one of the earliest users of Dorofus. So if there's something that you wanna know about Dorofus specifically, he's just as capable as I am. So I encourage you to try to challenge him with a Dorofus question at some point too. Okay. Should we do two minutes and fill up the glass and just... Uh... Sure. Okay. Any questions for me exporting Revit files to IFC? Yeah. I haven't heard in the past it was quite a bit of a loss. Is that still the case or is that being all It's the checkbox that I just showed you. Was that it? Okay. No one checks that checkbox. Okay. So they export to IFC and they're like, none of my Revit information came through. IFC sucks. It's a checkbox. <laughs> I think what I have found is that most people that use IFC that actually go to these building smart conferences and are talking about the, ele uh, the actual class tables that are involved, those people know what they're talking about and they're getting all the data. There's no complaints in Finland. There's no complaints in Norway because those guys are using IFC the way it's intended. Architects in the United States tend to be lazy and they don't actually learn what these industry classifications or classes actually are and they're just expecting the tool to automate their whole process. So what I have found to be true is that they check one box, they then become a fan of IFC, because they realize, wow, all my data actually exported, this thing is great. The other thing is the LOD aspect. Uh, IFC version four has now given four levels of model depth quality. So if you do an LOD that's really low, you're only gonna get lines that represent your furniture. LOD two, you're getting more curves. And I think the big problem with our industry is the over-modeling aspect. So if I model this chair at a high level of quality and I export that as a high, because I picked high because it was one of my options in IFC, now I've got a two gig IFC file and everyone told me IFC should be lighter than Revit. Yeah, but it can't inform you how to model things better. So I think if we improve the ability to model things with less detail and let a database actually manage the information we can go back to the CAD blocks that we used from 20 years ago and actually simplify our content, which I think everyone would actually appreciate. Um, 
I think that's the biggest problem with the industry when we went to BIM is we went to town and we modeled everything. I don't know if you guys agree with me, but like if I was a designer, I would model every one of these squares in this room oh, rather than just representing it as a light fixture. We'd have the cables. We'd have, the, we'd have four cables. Because it, in one of those, we're going to render it. Right. But we're going to do it all for you. I actually well, saw, all of them. I saw recently a web camera model. A web camera. And the speakers actually were voids in the webcam shape so that when you rotated it, you could see the little holes that represent the speaker in the webcam. Why are we modeling webcams in that? I have no idea. But that's like well, they downloaded some sort of like Logitech's now making Reddit content. I, I don't know. There's somebody out there, you know, like there's a lot of manufacturers that are producing the free content over downtown. Yeah, over content. But then you just people load it and really model it. It's easy. Close it up. Yeah. The other thing with IC is, is the worst in a lot of projects is the interoperability between softwares, right? What if you have a project with structures in, in uh, TechLab and not Revit and MVPs and ARCHICAD or Vector, you know, whatever, right? Yeah. How do you get all of those communicate one? And that's the big thing with IC. You take everything out, connect all the drove this. It doesn't matter what the source bit yeah. module is. No, I'm all for IC. I mean, I use yeah. Trinet Connect. I have some time, you just yes. drop it right in and you can see it, of course. Well, how long have we been IFC compliant? 2003-04, approximately. So 16 years we've been IFC compliant. Yeah. There's, there's probably not many people that even have known IFC in the United States, and we've been compliant for that long. Yeah, I can, I can start actually by giving a little bit of background. Since uh, Europus came first uh, time on the market, 2001, at that time, we were not thinking that this tool was supposed to solve anything outside of Norway. Uh, it was made for owners in the beginning uh, to simply replace all Excel sheets and Word documents to uh, handle the requirements to room, spaces, equipment. And uh, <clears throat> it was like in 2003, 4 we started to explore IFC simply to get some kind of model connection. And uh, Norway has been one of the front runners globally regarding supporting open standards uh, from the government. That's what kind of, okay, we thought that this might be good for our business to show that we support a governmental initiative. So uh, that's why we did it. Uh, until like 2005, six, that was when we started realizing that we have captured a process that actually were a problem outside of Norway as well. I, this might be business. So we started to explore what are the situation outside of Norway. 2008, we got in, in touch with um, HOK uh, because they were doing a, a really smart uh, project actually to find solutions to room data logistics. We were invited into that uh, process because there was a Norwegian guy uh, kind of uh, setting it up. So a lot of uh, things um, ended up with us being doing business with HOK from 2009. That was the first actually customer outside of our local markets. At that point, we were still part of another consultant company. Not before 2011, we set up the rooms as a separate company. And, uh, and saying that this is obviously we have touched something here that are a huge problem in many markets. And it looks like our tool are able to support it. And that means that we from 2011 started to work to, to make this uh, to a global company. And if you look upon this picture here, is, which is from 2011, it, it points out a fact that all of you know, the, the fact that if you are working uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a building project, there are several disciplines involved. All of them are working with their own tools to create the design, to create information. And uh, unless we have some kind of data sharing between them, um, in addition to uh, collision control of on the model and geometry, there's no way we can inform each other on where is this going. But the main question is, are we want to have, do we want to have data driven design or do we want to have design driven data? And globally, the majority of building projects are run as design-driven data creation. 
Dropus supports both workflows. It's important to say that. We don't force anyone to work in any way. They don't want to work. But the thing is that if this data, shared data, should be obviously in some kind of a database, right? What you will find in the market is a lot of database solutions that can collect data from design tools. And they are popping up every week almost. That is very different from being a container of data created in models than being a tool like the Ropers, which can support the workflows in each of these disciplines. What Brock has shown you now is a small, small piece of the Ropers software supporting and uh, working with interiors and finishes within the architectural uh, discipline. That kind of very deep workflow has uh, taken us <laughs> this many years to create in order to support not only collect data from models, but being able to create the data and support the designers who work within architectural, structural, uh, mechanical, electrical, you name it. So <clears throat> that means that a full, um, uh, a full um, demo of the robots would take hours simply because we would have to go into so many different workflows. And to make this a kind of a collaboration environment, then you need to have that kind of platform. So our mission, this model here is from the uh, UK um, public official BIM requirements back from 2013. It points out one important fact. Building industry might be very co uh, complex, but if you boil it down, it's very easy. It, it, it is three things. It is the geometry created in the BIM all three tools. It is the data uh, about the objects uh, that is in that model. And it's the documentation about what is this object. That's the three things of them. They pointed out that in the life cycle of a building, starting with a brief early on, what are we at all thinking of uh, uh, designing it and building and, and, and operation? It runs all the way through the brief concept, definition, design, build commission, handover, closeout, operation, and in use. That's the life cycle of a building. And finally, you, you tear it down again, like 50 years later. And to us, we are kind of the mid layer here, the non-graphical data. We can also handle the documentation and, and uh, store it inside of the database. But there are also tools, specific tools, that work specifically on documentation that we can link to. So for us, we want to be the, the tool that are able to support the workflow in the different phases and be the data sharing platform for everyone to collaborate on. That means that we came out of the requirements. Back in 2001 to 2005, more or less, we worked on the requirements data model. Room data sheet, uh, areas, departments, equipment, different disciplines, planning the equipment. 2008, our first Revit, 8.9, our first Revit connection came directly with the Revit plugin. That opened up the market for architects. Uh, and 2011, we came with the Archicad uh, plugin and construction and operation. What I'm gonna show you right now is how has our implementation been uh, in the different markets? Obviously, there are, have to be differences. Norway, we've been since 2001, and we have entering into different markets over time. So if you look upon Norway, we are spanning the life cycle there. We have a, a good uh, kind of uh, footprint in both supporting the uh, owner's requirements. The designers and engineers design uh, process, the, uh, the construction process, and the operation. In the operation, it is uh, specifically uh, Avinor who owns 45 airports in Norway. That is, to be honest, our, till date, only customer on the operational side. Why? Because we have been working with them for years to kind of document what we think could be a future for a database solution that goes in the life cycle. We will not be an FM tool. We will not operate any building. We will not host any of the maintenance of the building. 
but it makes a lot of sense to be the database that holds all the asset data in the lifecycle and connects to the FM tool. Why? By doing it like this, you kind of eliminate the handover. They are saying that we want your database in all our 45 airports to be the master asset database, simply because when we have finished a building, we start to renovate immediately. So the assets in the building goes between project operation, product operation back and forth. Keeping it in one database, it makes life much easier for, for the owner. They can track the, the, the assets in the life cycle. So this is what we have done in Norway, and that's the only place we have done it so far. So we go to Europe, the rest of the countries in Europe, we are represented by quite many of them. Um, many of the biggest projects running in Europe are using brokers. We have done uh, both owner um, a project where the owner is our customer. In Norway, almost all of our customers are the owner. The uh, state of Norway, the government, uh, the uh, owner of the airports, the uh, hospital uh, department owning all the hospitals uh, in the country, kind of standardized on the office. That, that's a home market. But the rest of Europe as well, they started to sign up the owners. They take on the contract and, and, and give access to all the, the participants, architects, engineers, contractors, use this tool so we can share the information across disciplines. And we also have a mix in Europe between owners and uh, architects and contractors taking on the road to the project and give access to the rest. In uh, Australia and the Pacific, we also have the same setup. The uh, health in infrastructure in New South Wales, state government mandated the use of droppers, all healthcare <laughs> institutions, meaning that all new uh, hospitals being planned and built in uh, Australia and New South Wales uh, have to use droppers. And the owner requirements and standards are hosted within droppers. National standards for all of Australia is hosted in droppers. So the new projects starting up, they start with the standards, and then the architects can go on board and work out of that. So we have uh, both owners, state owners, private owners, uh, design companies, and contractors in uh, Australia. Last customer we signed up in this region was Takanaka, a massive, massive company in Japan, standardizing on the roofs for their data, for their, uh, their planning of room equipment design. So we have not gone into operation yet, but when I was, I came from Australia now, you know, last week I was there. The owners over there are obviously looking at what's happening in, in uh, Scandinavia, since Scandinavia has been a front runner in BIM implementation for many years. They are starting to see what should we do with our assets. I would expect that we would do some kind of a Abinor model also in Australia within the next year. US though, uh, we do have a lot of big accounts in the U.S. Um, many of the big design companies in the U.S. have been our customers. And uh, meaning that what has been um, used of the ropers uh, in the U.S. has been design companies taking on the ropers to support the design process, which is obviously um, very good, very important, and helps them to execute their part of the project. But it's it's, it's part of the software that is not being uh, come to use in the US as, uh, as we speak. This is about to change though. The fact that we signed up after years of discussion, Kaiser Permanente, to replace their in-house tool for planning of their healthcare facilities will hopefully change this setup in the US. Kaiser Permanente will mandate the use of the office for all architects working for them. Obviously, that will have an impact on the industry simply because this is the platform where they can host their standards, they can express their requirements. So when the architect comes on board for this new project, this is what we want you to design and we can validate uh, at any time how the design, design answers the requirements and see the deviations there over time. It helps actually all parties to have this kind of insight in what is the relationship between the owner requirements and the design solutions. 
So, um, on the con um, construction uh, part, also want to mention, I don't know how big Buick is in the US, in Europe and the Pacific, they are they are one of the biggest global in the world. Yeah, one of the yeah. biggest in the world. They should not be here. You just sign them up and they will standardize their office in all the projects as well, uh, hopefully, meaning that we have signed a global contract that we can grow into. Hopefully, we will be able to see in the US that we will see the same implementation, at least as in Europe and APAC, where the roofs are being used, different parts of it, to bind things together, where all participants get their workflow support. Brock showed you how interior designers can automate a lot of things that today are manual. What is the alternative to what, what Brock showed you today? That is uh, tons of Excel sheets, a lot of different silos of information not possible to share with others on an online platform. So <laughs> this is the setup where we are uh, hope to see some uh, progress within uh, 2019 and uh, in the coming years where we can also deploy the ROFUS to different parts of the value chain in the US. If you then look into where are we going from this and um, show you a few uh, highlights. Uh, having this platform now with the possibility of having all the data <clears throat> from the different disciplines available, obviously the importance of having the possibility of other tools to connect to it is, is uh, crucial. So we are building now an API and documenting it, making it possible for other um, tools to integrate the hook directly into Rofus easily without having to have special solution every time. To connect, for instance, Power BI or any other tools easily to dig into this data, create stuff out of it that we cannot uh, kind of support on, uh, on short notice, would help our customers to, to get more value out of the data that has been set up in Brokers. We will also work with integrations on other tools. Uh, as you know, we are part of the Nemetric group, and they have a lot of other great brands. In the US, especially like Bluebeam and Solibri are, are present. So typically for us to build stronger uh, connections to our sister brands uh, will be an obvious choice. And th this is like on our roadmap for 2.19 and beyond. You, you will see some great connections here between Nemetric brands. Uh, and we will obviously still uh, keep up with our, uh, I would say, leading integration with, with Revit and all of its products through their open API. Uh, reporting has been, uh, we, have, we do have tons of customizable reports. So um, obviously most of the report uh, requirements are met already in the tool. We have had like so many years to build them that they are, they are meeting most of the requirements. Our power users though have a need of customizing reports quite extensively. So what we are working on now is making it easier to make the design of the reports uh, uh, better for the end user to customize themselves. Uh, <clears throat> on the web front end, what Brock showed you uh, briefly now was like the uh, web interface of the database. I would say that as we speak, uh, this one has reached now a level where we can say it is close to be uh, feature complete on being a window into, uh, into the BIM. Because it holds all the data across all disciplines possibly, and it holds also the, uh, the models from different disciplines. What he showed you on the viewer there was a model server. Multiple model, models from multiple disciplines can be uploaded and be shown as a, uh, a full model of the building. So you can then uh, start to dig into rooms, equipment in rooms, systems, components of systems, documentation, and you can see it graphically as it was designed in Revit or whichever tool you're using. If we, but that, at this point, this is a read, mostly read-only um, interface. Now we will start to add functionality to that. Then we will talk to our main customers and ask them what will be your highest priority of adding now a functionality to this. Everything of the the, uh, the uh, editing and change of data and planning you can do in the client. Should we duplicate some of that or should we do something else? Uh, <clears throat> so one thing has been, for instance, 
let's say that we are adding something called a role-based validation and checkout features. If you have a multidisciplinary team working on planning and designing, being able to create you a front a, a, a web interface to an owner who will be able to validate at the checkout at the end of the project, yes, this room is delivered as described, uh, is good, good to go. But not only between owner and, and uh, contractor, maybe between contractor, subcontractor, they also have the same relationship. Have the sub subcontractor delivered all the documentation on the things they have provided. That is a nightmare uh, most of the times to make sure that you are up to speed regarding what you are supposed to deliver. These kind of workflows we should maybe add to this, uh, this setup. Also, to go on the web, not only be able to read the data <coughs> and, uh, and sort it and get the interface that you want to see, but to take that out in a report. Excel, for instance, to just fit it out in Excel. PDF reports, is that a, uh, is that a value? Or should we do a uh, uh, possibility of doing the data entry and the edits directly in the web interface instead of having the installed uh, client on your computer that connects to a server? All of these are now in discussion in the company. And <clears throat> if you are uh, a customer or want to be a customer, and obviously all inputs are valuable to us regarding what we will do now this year and beyond regarding adding this feature to, to, the, to the web front. So this is a little bit, uh, hopefully I'm able to give you a broader picture of where are we aiming to go and where, what do we have to do to, to get there. We have to support all of the individual workflows to a degree where people will start using that as a planning tool, build a design up on that, or be able to be a backend of Revit uh, or RTCAD in a way where people uh, still can use the tool to be the uh, tool that gathers all the data across all the disciplines to have it all uh, set up one place. I don't know how much of um, the, um, the requirements uh, for Kobe you are uh, exploring, but in some markets, that is a big thing. In Europe and Australia, that is a um, that is a requir contract requirement. You have to uh, export the data on Kobe. It was invented in the U.S. by Bill East, so I would expect that Kobe at some point would be a standard deliverable uh, or similar in the U.S. as well. But anyway, you can imagine that getting all that data out of all those disciplines in one database and export it out as a fully Kobe compliant sheet. That is a big advantage. That's what I'm doing now in Australia, delivering to the government. Using the ROFUS to print an Excel that looks exactly with, with the correct color code and setup <coughs> uh, of the Kobe sheet to be the deliverable from the whole design team. That's quite different from doing exports out of each and every one of the models, put it together and then hand it over. I'm more than happy to take any questions you have, but this so was. Are you, are you like yeah, yeah, 100. We're doing it in Canada as well. So upper infrastructures mandating code requirement outputs as well, but it, it, it is literally that. I mean, once you get it set up, because you're cropping all of the information during the project, the end to create the report is simply like click. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's, that's literally at the end because you've already done all the work, you've already collected it all. So you're not having to spend this big batch of time at the end of the project where you're trying to get it all to work. That being said, <clears throat> the, the fact that I showed you now that in different regions, we have different uh, kind of limitations. Obviously, if only the architect are using it, as we see many examples of in the US, well, then you only have one discipline uh, having the data going in there. You cannot get a Kobe uh, out of the project if only one discipline have used it. Obviously, that. Technology is one part, but I would say that 50% of the success is still the processes uh, and the collaboration connected to it. The agreements that is done within the team or regarding how should we do this stuff to make it happen together. So we see very successful implementations of brokers and we see some horrible implementations. I am quite sure it's not the fault of the software since we see both. 
So that means that to get success out of this, it is, a, it is also a requirement of getting the right execution plan in place, make sure that it is someone decide how it is going to be done, and then make sure that it is uh, across the disciplines uh, weekly, made sure that we are following the plan to simply work together on this. Then it becomes a success. Do you see that, do you ever see the build phase uh, basically pushing the envelope of the office and say pushing it outwards towards the design and to the operation side? Yeah, we see it definitely with uh, general contractors who have understood that if they don't um, make sure that ha what happens before they're going to build it, they have a big problem of building it correctly and hand it over to the owner in a state where the owner is happy. So those general contractors who kind of act as an owner, they are one of our best customers. When they understand that we have to make sure that this works, they are in a position to mandate stuff, not only what tools to use, but also which processes to follow, which deliverable that has to be in place, and simply, uh, democracy is not too good in these kind of projects. It has to be someone to decide how to do stuff. And we, that's when we see the good projects. It's when someone decides. Good question. What do you think, or what's particular about the U.S. that's preventing that in relation with operation uh, being lower than in other parts of the world? I mean, I, I believe was supported by the NIA many, many years ago, we're still arguing that it hasn't been crushed to the full extent. Uh, what do you speculate on why? So I would say it's two things. Uh, the first one is we came in on the backs of HOK, right? So everybody just said, oh, you're an architecture tool, right? So that's a really hard thing to get over because that's just what they assume you are. Um, even though if you go to, to APAC or, or Europe, you know, it's, it's everything. That's the first part. The second part is there's a lot of straight up old school design bid build, and that's not used globally very much. I mean, it's a very adversarial where we're going to pitch all three against each other. So why would you ever use a tool where they're going to work together? You know, it's like, well, no, I don't want to deal with it. So if you can find any any situation where we have real estate and contractors together, that kind of kind of scenario, easy adoption because they're on the, the same the same path. Or if, or if you got something like Kaiser Permanente, which can simply mandate the whole thing the whole way through. I'm like just going to do what I say because we're a private entity and that's how we want it. Piece of cake. Um, and in any and like in Canada, we have a ton of uptake lately because of their P3s, right? Everybody's on the same same page. But I mean, for us, for the option, a lot of it was was simply. I mean, it was great. In HOK said we like your Opus, but in the same sense, it was like, oh, you're a design tool. And so it's taken a while to get that. I want to I want to speculate also that this is the the degree of the, or the extent of the uh, government mandate is uh, less. It's limited, yeah. It's very limited here as it is in other parts of Europe. Right? Uh, uh, you mentioned a government mandate here, and then you mentioned socialism. <laughs> and it scares people away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, but like, you, you go to like Tekanaka that we are just talking about, they don't have any government mandates, and that's. They're just a very efficient construction firm that gets the idea there. So, I mean, you, I agree. I totally agree. But, but I, I guess yeah. that it's not communism if KP requires the architects to use it, meaning that that's kind of a rule set yeah, yeah, to yeah. apply to, which people in the business will accept immediately. Right. So, I don't mean anything else with it, that the fact that what you see in this industry, though, is that for, for, for first, within each of these disciplines, there are several contracts to be made with the participants, hundreds, meaning that it, the industry is run by contracts. So every participant is actually most interested in, I will do my job, I get paid for this. Why should I care <coughs> for the bigger picture? You can't, you can't expect that. It, the, it's the, it is the owner or the general contractor who is in the position to take the overall responsibility for the full value chain. For the industry to change, these guys have to do some overall uh, framework to so that people see that, okay, my work is important for my contract to get paid, but it's also important for other people to know what I'm doing. So for, for one of these guys in the architectural uh, sector to buy some kind of tool for door planning, well, fine, maybe it solves their problem. 
but it doesn't solve anything for anybody else unless it is a tool that is sharing information with the other uh, participants. And this is the whole thing that as long as the industry is run by contracts and no one takes the responsibility of the framework that goes across everything, you don't see progress. We, we are, though, actually seeing recently, and I won't throw any architectural names out there, but just the big three-letter architecture firms, like all of them. Uh, <laughs> no, but but uh, there are some firms that are now starting to go out, and it, because the one advantage the architect has is they get access to the owner before anybody else does, right? They get they get unfeathered access to the owner for months. And so what they're doing is they're pushing their offices, hey, we're going to use it, and we'd like to get your buy-in because we think it would help you operate the facility, We'll do our part, but then you need a mandate that the contractor uses it, the secondary part, and we're going to push off to then you guys can use it to operate as well. So that only comes into play where the owner is also the operator, right? It's not going to come in a strip malls where they're building and dumping it. But, you know, hospitality, hotel, or uh, hospitals, airports, those kind of things where the owner is operating facility, it's the architect that sells it as an upsell, right? Well, we did the service for you. We know how to use the software. We did the database. The next project we should do as well. Right? It just makes sense. So yeah, the, in the hospitality industry, the people that I've had conversations with, uh, they, like at Marriott, you know, Four Seasons, or at least the people I've talked to, they, they have no idea what your office is. Yep. And then when I tell them that I'm really interested in this because I'm, you know, dedicated to the Revit modeling and we're so much more productive with that, but we can convert your program into the office and then uh, our model can relate to that. And then, as I understand it, you're going to be able to see this on your iPad, how we're relating to your model. They go, Tom, we've never heard of this. We think you're making it up. <laughs> so yeah. um, why aren't you guys better known in this country? And, you know, why are you more articles and not just productive about it? Because that's a good question. It's, that's the, missing, it's the keystone the missing. That's a good question, actually. And honestly, if, if we go t 10 years back, when we kind of had a, a contract with HOK, did I even imagine that it would uh, that we would spend 10 years and look at the industry as a whole and so little had happened? I, I, I couldn't imagine it. I thought that this would get much, go much faster. And, uh, not necessarily for us, but for the industry to change the way of working and making it more integrated and automated. And uh, it, it, it's simply going very slow in the industry as a whole, not only in the U.S., uh, worldwide. And at one point, it has to change. And the, the fact that if you look upon what are the, in the, in the space here, who are the competitors for the Rofus, that's an interesting question. Um, because if the fact that there are so few competitors, that is not good for us. It should be many more. Because that would mean that the whole setup and concept. Yeah, everybody's interested. Yeah, in this here. it is also a picture of not enough interest in the industry in general. Okay, we have been able to build a global a company and a tool around this, but why aren't we bigger than Autodesk almost yeah, or Nemechek uh, in the total? Since we are one of the only ones that are you know, trying to capture the whole data portion of everything that is created in the BIM environment. That is a big, big task to take on. And and simply because we are facing a design-focused, design-driven uh, industry where people are very um, um, <laughs> hard to change uh, the way of working. Uh, it is, in my mind, a uh, challenge. Even if it's to us who work with it, it's obvious that this will obviously have to be much more efficient, much more uh, better for, for instance, the owners. Why isn't it? Uh, well, there was a time I remember, uh, you know, we're building information model and you know, article in AutoCAD's magazine called Cadence, you know, about 20 years ago saying, you know what, this building information model is around the corner, it'll allow you to have this virtual model, and, and it's almost, I'm feeling it's, it's the same environment right now, or, oh yeah, I'll believe it when I see it, and now we're all living in, in Reddit, and, you know, we get along with the client, and I would say it's a great improvement, but it's a tremendous amount of chaos still. It is. However, what 
attracting me to the presentation that Reed Gupta did on uh, <coughs> about Doropus and how she used it on, on the hospitals it, for the resort projects. It was, it's like, wow, I need this. And, and uh, so, I, you know, I'm excited about it. The one thing that, that I'd say is that I have learned all of the programs that I we know today, you know, about that monitoring and about the real 3D on, on YouTube videos and Linda.com. And if it's like, are you all on Vimeo? Do you have, can you teach me all on Vimeo how to get up to speed? Because I think that through that, the power of being able to learn like that in this world, I don't know about all of you folks, but that's how I learn how to use it. You know, and, and I can, I'm at a loss here in my office because I learned how to be rushed from all of these young guys that are sitting around me. But I have, other than rocking to get you to come down here and be it into my head, it's so well, funny. It, it's it's so, a good point. Cause that's I, just my suggestion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think from a learning standpoint, um, I learned Reddit from other Reddit users, which is probably the worst way to learn Reddit because you're learning bad, bad practices at the same time. So there's a unique advantage with being a technology that people haven't used poorly to be able to define the right workflows. And so having people like Reedy presenting Doropus workflows publicly is a great a testament. So yeah. one of the value propositions related to other software you've learned is that it's been around for 15 years. And Reddit's actually been around for close to 20 years now. So there are people that have been using the software for 20 years that are writing those presentations, those London.com. Yeah, they do. They have, I think the Revit uh, series of uh, tools in London.com, which is now LinkedIn, right. the learning was amazing. And then I was, since I got turned on the real 3D, um, I'm amazed that all of a sudden uh, LinkedIn, learning London.com, it's, okay, here's how, you translate your uh, Reddit model through 3D Studio and, you know, and put all of the lighting in and, right. and get you going on that. A program that, you know, six months ago, everybody's going, man, i got to learn this, i got to learn this. But, right. you know. Well, the, the challenge for me, speaking as a user, is when I was teaching Dorotus, um almost six years ago, it was a very different product. So the workflows and the ideas of using the tool, it's kind of a challenge that we're evolving so far, so often, that if we did do a full Lynda.com series or LinkedIn series, this is how you use Doropus, we'd have to redo it like every six months, which maybe that's a good problem to have because of the evolution of the technology. But the other challenge is who's the user? I think if I'm a Reddit user, it's very easy to say, this is how you use Revit architecture. I'm an architect, so I'm going to use it. The challenge of Dorothis is what is the use case? Are you an owner creating standards? Are you an architect designing? Are you a contractor building the use cases of the assets? I'd watch them all. Right? There's a lot of content there because it relates to workflows. We're also finding that the industry works differently across different regions. So do you develop a workflow that is Norwegian? Do you develop a workflow that's Australian? So we, we definitely know that it would be great to have a learning management system online where there's self-based training, but some of the challenges that we're learning is uh, the, the workflows are very uh, specific. The, the customization, there's such a vast amount of things you can do to customize the tool. Whereas I know when I was first using Revit, there were very few options, you know, that. You, you, could, you could only use aerial text in your labels. <laughs> you know, so to some degree, limitations are sometimes a, a value proposition to learn the tool specifically. The flexibility and the customization of all these workflows, there's, there's a lot to share there. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so I work for an owner slash uh, builder, and this is exactly the type of problem that we have to deal with every day. Um, more specifically on the finishes, what happens if the manufacturer or the supplier does not have a catalog of materials? Can you still choose? So you can't link to it online, you mean? Yeah. So yeah. like. Probably you have a PDF of it. You just upload a PDF for documentation of this is what it is. 
So okay. you have that available online. Uh, uh, not online, but in their office on that occurrence in that room. In any library that you create or one project carries over to the next. So if you guys start to have your own corporate standards, like this is what we did on the project, that library carries on as your starting point for the next. So you don't have to rely on the, the vendors. Okay, but okay. you you input the PDF yourself. Yeah. So it, you have to know the manufacturer already. It doesn't only just drop the product down. aspect. Okay. What about alternatives? Give me a give me a workflow where you're, you're talking about that. Like, would you wouldn't know the. So, for example, right now we're dealing with countertops, yeah. and um, we want more control over the product because our interior designer is just not good. And so we're bringing in all of the manufacturers, all of the suppliers. They've given us a finished schedule with just like probably over a hundred types of materials and finishes. And I want maybe five manufacturers to do everything. So on that one, what you would do is you would, get, you would do it a bunch of different ways by just you could either have drop down menus. Um, so I've worked for universities, right? And so the University of Nebraska, this is the only floor you can use. I know there's five million flooring materials out there, but I'm still the guys only want to take these four, these four. So when they're working on the database and they're going through to select their finishes or their countertops, it's all you pick. You can't go if you want to specify something else. We got out a discussion about it. So that's one thing that could be done. Say they could have the products, right? You could have the product loaded with these are the products that are approved by us. And if you want something beyond that, well then we've got to have a discussion. Does that answer go through or not? Who who has to have that discussion? Because I'm, you know, I, I want to make a decision today. You know, this product is too expensive, but I want a product that looks and like you this product. Just that into your office and say that that's the only you just swap it with another one. Yeah. But I would have to find that product myself. Yeah, but uh, if you set up a, you said that you had like hundred counted ups that were kind of in question. Why didn't you just load up all of them as an alternative so you can just pick by them? Because they're for different locations in different buildings and different uses. And yeah. There's definitely a workflow that could be established for all of those scenarios. Because we're, we're currently dealing with this with guys from that day where, not to use countertops as an example, but Colorado has different standards than Northern California because of various deliverables and vendors that can actually provide the equipment and those kind of requirements. So our workflow is to establish what the minimum requirements are. And then per region, they're then going to have the products that are specific to those regions. So it's a very easy parameter if you say it's Northern California as a parameter or it's Colorado. So as you build a standard, it then becomes the standard for future projects. But on a per project basis, they're going to find there's some equipment because a year from now, medical equipment might not even be invented yet that they're going to end up using. So what they end up doing is at that time, they're actually going to upload that new piece of equipment and swap out all their standards. So you can always be upgrading what your standard is as projects inform those decisions per project. Sure. Uh, I understand what you're saying. That's not quite my question. Uh, standards are, are great and they can definitely be accounted for, but I'm more concerned about the money aspect, right? Like, I want something that looks like this, but it's cheaper. And I want to be able to show my developer, you know, because we have a contracting and a developing branch. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to show them, like, you can pick from these five options. And so the research is the hard part you're doing. I think that's always going to be the case because there's always going to be companies that are providing solutions related to products. I know when I was an architect specifying carpet, I thought there were a thousand carpet manufacturers, and we find out there's like three in Georgia that do most of the carpets in the country. So once you find that out, then you realize that which companies and which tiers of quality are available for the use from products. And sometimes it's just an experience to, to know that. But if you have a database that where you can collect it, once you do the research, now you have a place where you can store it and you find it later. So you're saying that the guys uh, creates a database essentially right. over the time. So as you're doing research from project to project, you're basically pulling that as knowledge so you don't look for it again. 
Collaboration aspect that we're all talking about. If you actually give access to more people to the same data sets, you can say, Architects, I need you to input this data, and contractor, I need you to input this data. It's centralized, it's in one place. And some people hesitate to, like, well, I, I don't want to give people access. And we don't have time to show it, but there's actually permissions where you can actually limit different people's access to different portions. Unlike an Excel file, how many versions of the Excel file do you have? You have the six versions that you sent out, and then you're trying to piece them back together. Uh, giving up the person a username and a password, they have access to that portion. Right. So it's a. Historically, they've been talking about that. But yes, essentially, yeah. That's how it works. So either a team buys it, contractor buys it, architect buys it, or the owner buys it. One of the three buys it, right? Before, right? And everything is out. And it's unlimited, it's not for license. It's unlimited users, right? Because if it's collaboration tool, like we just said, and we start to a user, quiz and bottlenecks. Oh, let's have four people. You know, then you're funneling everything. And then the four letters sitting in a queue. The idea is it's based on project size. Um, that's the that's, so the bigger the project, the more expensive, the smaller the less. Um, that's typically only at the very beginning when you kind of test it on a project. Um, really quickly, it goes to what we call enterprise, and you just buy blocks of square footage, like you know, 20 million, 50 million, 10 million, somewhere. I mean, you name it, it's all across the scope. <clears throat> I, I just want to make a good point. There's a few people online, so I just want to answer some of those questions so that uh, we can let them go if yep. there's some further discussions. There was one question uh, from Shanghai. Uh, Xavier, can you tell something on Chinese market for 2019? Do you believe Dorofus is, um, I do believe Dorofus is amazing BIM services for hospitalities and hotels and airports. Um, so Rolf, what's your vision related to the Asian market specifically? In, in, uh, in the market where he is, in Shanghai. Um, I would say that um, uh, the uh, Takenaka uh, deal is the first major customer we have signed up in Asia. So that becomes kind of the starting point for us to put people on the ground and start to grow into the Asian market. We have been close to signing agreements uh, with um, la uh, large uh, Chinese uh, contractors, but uh, we didn't end up uh, doing it. But obviously, for us to grow into both the Chinese and the general Asian market, we need people on the ground, and the Takenaka deal gives us the opportunity to start growing into that market. But uh, regardless of that, if there are any major opportunities in the Chinese market that are interested in do the ropes, we will definitely be available and accommodate it. So uh, for the, the user that asked the question, uh, Xavier, if, if you want to reach out to us and you want to be our Dropus champion in China, that could be a that could be a, a future discussion that could be had. So I've never been to China, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming. <laughs> Needs an excuse to come to China. Yeah, I lived in Shanghai for two years. <laughs> Is there anyone else that's on uh, on the call virtually that have any questions before we wrap up the go to meeting portion? If not, um, we're actually going to end the online meeting and we'll just continue the discussion uh, offline. Thanks, guys, for your participation.